Well, good morning, fam. How are you this morning? Man, is it good to be with you. A special welcome if you're joining us digitally. I just really feel compelled. Can I, can I pray for us before we begin? I just have a sense that God is up to something way beyond this today, and so I just want to begin with just a, a posture of prayer. So let's, let's go before the Lord right now. God, thank you that you're not off on some distant planet, but you're here right in our midst, God. Give us eyes to see. Give us hearts to understand, God. Give us courage to live it out the way that you're stirring and moving in our midst, God. Help us to be more aware of your presence at work, God. Stir in us today. Do what only you can do, God. We thank you and we love you and we give this entire time to you. And we ask all of this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, I thought it would be fun to start today with a little word association game. Is that all right? I'm doing it anyway, so it's happening either way. Um, I'll say a word, and then I want you to kind of imagine the picture that comes to mind when you hear that word, okay? Simple enough. Okay, so first word is NASCAR. What comes to mind? Some people are already responding. Lovely. What comes to mind when you think of the word NASCAR? I want you to picture it in your mind. Do you picture, like, actual NASCARs? Like, is that... Is that what they're called, by the way? Is that where it come from? Like, oh, NASCAR. Is that what it... I don't under... I don't know. Um... Maybe you actually picture, like, NASCAR fans. Maybe that's more your... <laughs> I apologize for inflicting that on you. I'm so sorry. That's, that's awful. Okay, all right, we got to get that off the screen. Maybe, uh, okay, next word is CrossFit. What, <laughs> what comes to mind when you think of the word CrossFit? Maybe, maybe you picture something like this. This woman just getting after it, right? Maybe she probably had, like, a egg white omelet with kale for some reason or something. She, she got this done by 5 a.m. If you're like me, maybe you think of this when you hear the word CrossFit, though. Something more like that. Um, <laughs> anyone in that boat? Yeah. The only CrossFit I need is the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? <laughs> oh, don't. No, it's so stupid. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I apologize. How about the word homeschooler? Ooh, the room got really quiet all of a sudden. Just as an aside, I was homeschooled, so I'm allowed to make these jokes, okay? So when you think of the word homeschooler, maybe you picture something like this. That's, oh, just serene. The mother, the child, they're both enjoying it. They're learning. They're growing together. Or maybe you took the Ian Simpkins route, and it looks something more like this. Um, I was going through some stuff at the time, okay? Don't judge me. It was a very weird year for me, but that is actually me, unfortunately. And I know you can't unsee that. My apologies. Um, <laughs> some of you are like, what church did we come to today? Uh, but how about the word Christian? What, what comes to mind when you hear the word Christian? Maybe like a lot of people, you think of the great evangelist Billy Graham, right? Maybe that's the person that you think of when you think of Christian, the evangelist Billy Graham. Maybe you think of like a televangelist, like Robert Tilton, maybe you're picturing like that particular type of Christianity. Or maybe, maybe the most inspiring figure of Christianity of all time, Ned Flanders. Maybe that's who you <laughs> conjure up when you think of Christians and Christianity. But what, what, what exactly is a Christian? Is it someone who like prayed a prayer or knows their Bible really well or... Like they're a part of a certain denomination or they attend a certain community, they've checked the right boxes, they have good moral behavior. What actually is a Christian? So often, Christianity is reduced to simply believe the right things, go to heaven when you die. Anyone handed that version of Christianity? Just believe the right things and you get to go up instead of down. We actually call this in and out Christianity. We talked about this last week, this idea of in and out Christianity is just do the right thing and you're in, you're safe. We call this the bounded set. And if you are handed in and out Christianity, you are sold a lemon because Jesus never speaks of Christianity quite in this way at all. In fact, last week I talked a little bit about a, a conversation that I had with my dad. When I was in high school, uh, I was making a bunch of really dumb decisions, as evidenced by that picture of me, actually, earlier. I was making a lot of really bad decisions, and I remember my dad sat me down, and it was actually a pretty emotional exchange, and he said, listen, you'll always be my son, 
but I want so much more for you than just namesake. I want so much more for you than to just have my last name. I want the fullness of joy and purpose and meaning and identity and freedom in your life. And since becoming a father, I feel that way for my kids now. Am I glad they're mine? Of course, but I want so much more for them than just namesake. God desires for us way more than just in and out Christianity. It's a very, very small piece of the picture, but it's not the whole thing. There's a, a pastor and author named John Ortberg. I think he puts it brilliantly. He says, do you know what never defines the word Christian? The Bible, literally. It never calls anyone to become a Christian. Even Jesus never uses the word Christian. Jesus never says, here's how to become a Christian. Jesus never describes what a Christian is. Jesus himself wasn't even a Christian. He was Jewish. In fact, the word Christian is used only three times in the entire New Testament, and then only because Jesus' followers were becoming too ethnically diverse to be regarded as a sect within Judaism. Right? Right? Three times in the entire New Testament, this word Christian shows up. Now, that's not to say that the word doesn't have meaning and purpose. I think it has huge implications. Literally, it means to be of the party of Jesus, to belong to Christ, to be in that tribe. But for this whole series, and we're in week two of this, this changes everything, we, we want to move people from simply thinking about Christianity as this in and out exchange to something way more profound. Jesus proclaims good news over and over and over again. Mark records it like this. This is Jesus speaking. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now don't, don't freak out about that word repent. It literally just means to change directions. And so what Jesus is saying here is actually very scandalous. He's saying the kingdom of God is actually close. It's near. It's here. It's come. And you can live in it right here and now. It's not just about praying a prayer, checking a box, and getting to heaven when we die. It's about bringing heaven to earth right here and now in our relationships, in our vocation, in our finances, in our interactions, in our social media. It's bringing heaven to earth. That, that's why this is so important. And Jesus is both the map and the treasure. He's the map and the treasure. Now, the very next verse here in Mark, Jesus says something very peculiar, something very strange happens here. In verse 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Now, this is easy to miss, but these guys were not just fishing, they were fishermen. This was the fullness of their identity. If you were to ask them about themselves, this would have come up. And many of you feel the same way. What you do or what you've done is very deeply tied with your identity and your purpose. They weren't just fishing for leisure, they were fishermen. Everything that they knew, their livelihood was wrapped up in this activity. And this is the scene that Jesus walks up on, which I thought was really interesting because they're having a normal day. For them, this is just like any other ordinary day. And maybe you're in that space today. You're like, well, Sundays is the day that we go to church, right? We drive to this location. We're there for about an hour and then we go about our week. Maybe today for you feels like any other ordinary day. You're just doing what you would normally do. Look, look what happens in the very next verse. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of people. Come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of people, I'll make you fishers of humans. Not, hey, believe the right things, know the right people. He He's inviting them to something far more profound than just some intellectual ascent. He's inviting them to become a disciple. Now, the word disciple here is actually the word talmudin, which is maybe better translated as apprentice. It's why we so often use the word apprentice around here. And we read earlier that the word Christian shows up only three times. Three times the word Christian shows up, but the word disciple shows up 269 times. Over and over and over again, we're called not just to simply make a decision to be in instead of out, 
But to be an apprentice of Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus, is something that he's inviting them in the story, and I believe he's inviting us in this room to something way more than just attending an event, and events are fine. Way more than just praying a prayer, and prayer is great. But is it possible, though, that we've narrowed what Jesus actually intended? Now, for the Jews, like, religious education and discipleship was kind of embedded together. In fact, uh, most Jewish boys around the age of six would begin with what's called Bet Sefer. And from about six to 10, they would memorize the entire Torah. That's the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. So imagine 10 year olds memorizing the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Now what would happen is they would have sort of a graduation. So at the end of this, they would choose the cream of the crop to move on to the next stage. And those who didn't make the cut, they sent home. They were a part of this program for probably two, three, four years. And they would say, hey, you got a great heart. You got great passion. You don't have what it takes. Go home and take up your father's trade. The next stage, called Bet Talmud. It's from about 10 to 13, where they would memorize the entire Hebrew Bible, all 39 books. And they would live their life just absorbing and understanding and reading and debating. And then again, there'd be a sort of graduation. You'd have the cream of the crop that would graduate, and the rest, they would be told, go home. Take up your father's trade. And then the final stage, Bet Midrash, is these disciples, these pupils, these students would then find a rabbi and plead their case. They'd fill out the application. They'd bring their resume and say, please let me be your disciple. They'd ask them, let me take on your yoke. And if the rabbi chose you, you then lived your life with that rabbi. In fact, there was a phrase that came up as a result, and it was this, to be covered in the dust of your rabbi. They wore sandals. It was a dusty area. It wasn't just learn about this rabbi and understand his teachings. It was spend so much time with him, walk so closely with him, that literally the dust from his sandals kicks up on his face. That's the picture that Jesus gives here for discipleship. But he's calling fishermen, though. He's very literally calling guys that didn't make the cut. Somewhere in their childhood, someone told them, hey, you got a great heart, but you're just not good enough. Go and take up your father's trade. So this rabbi Jesus is traveling and speaking and healing, and he comes across a couple of fishermen, and he calls the ones who didn't make the cut, the the ones who assumed they missed out. I imagine maybe there wasn't a week that went by that they weren't reminded how much they didn't make the cut. They assumed they missed out, and then Jesus calls them to be a disciple. So what what is a disciple? I think Dallas Willard says it perfectly. A disciple or apprentice is simply someone who has decided to be with another person under appropriate conditions in order to become become capable of doing what that person does or to become what that person is. As a disciple of Jesus, I am with him by choice and by grace learning from him how to live in the kingdom of God. I am learning from Jesus to live my life as he would live my life if he were me. That's way different than in and out Christianity, isn't it? It's this chosen withness. It's allowing God to actually transform and shape my heart and mind and will. I begin to look differently as a result because I'm not just studying as a spectator. I'm actually following. I'm covered in the dust of the rabbi. And this is the invitation here. Jesus is inviting them not just to learn but to follow. Maybe we could say it this way. It's one thing to tell people how to live. It's another thing entirely to show them. That's the invitation here. Jesus is saying, hey, I see you out there fishing, and you're doing a good job. Do you want to know what real life is about? Do you want me to show you what this thing truly is? Do you feel like you've missed out this morning? Do you feel like your window has closed? Do you feel like you didn't make the cut? You're in great company. Jesus loves calling unqualified, overlooked people. He makes a habit of it, it seems. It's one thing to tell people how to live. It's another thing to say, come follow me. Come experience 
real meaning, real purpose, real identity? Are you caught on a treadmill of always trying to be successful enough and smart enough and holy enough? We get to opt out by the grace of Jesus because he shows us a different way. This word make here that he uses when he says, I'm gonna make you fishers of men, literally means to form, to shape. It's not just downloading information matrix style. He says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna form and shape you into who you really are. Jesus isn't just concerned with what we're doing. He's concerned with who we're becoming. So what is that? Who are we becoming? Are, are we checking a box? Are we going to an event? Or are we actually following Jesus with our lives? So he, here's how they respond. Verse 18. At once, they left their nets and followed him. At once. Now, I love this about the gospel writer Mark because he's sort of like the caffeinated gospel. Everything's like at once. Or immediately, he's always going from like one thing to the next. But we're given this description of these guys fishing, just minding their own business. And then this peculiar rabbi says, hey, come follow me. And at once they left everything. Don't, don't miss this. It's easy for us to kind of remove ourselves from the story. Their, their fishing wasn't just their security, it was their identity. That's how they lived. That's how they found their purpose and identity. It was caught up in being fishermen. But we become who God wants us to be, not just simply by learning about him, as important as that is. We're transformed by following him. So what, what does that look like? A couple of suggestions. The first is to release. To release. Mark says, at once they drop their nets. I want, I want you to picture that for a moment. This is a, a real fishing net from uh, ancient Israel. I'm just kidding, it's from Etsy, it's ridiculous. It's like... <laughs> made to hold shells and stuff. It's so dumb. Um, but I want you to picture that. They're minding their own business. They're, they're literally holding their nets. This guy from the shore goes, hey, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I don't know about you, but I'd be more like, just ignore him. He'll go away. That guy's crazy, right? Like that would be my impulse. And the text says, at once they dropped their nets. What they didn't do was this. Okay, could I... Um, could I just put these away real nice first? Could I just fold them up? Can I, uh, I mean, they're really wet. You gotta treat these things really, no. What they didn't say was, all right, I'm interested, but could I come back and fish on the weekends as sort of like a side hustle just to kind of make sure that I can still make ends meet? No, no, no. What does it say that they did? At once, they drop their nets and they follow him. And the thing that I find so interesting about nets is that they're things that entangle us. What's the net that you're holding on to this morning? This is the picture of idolatry. It's when we make good things ultimate things. And when we put the expectation of God on anything other than God, that thing eventually crumbles beneath the weight. The thing that you're holding on to might be a very, very good thing. It might be an addiction. It might be something really obvious. But it might be the pursuit of wealth. It might be climbing the corporate ladder. It might be Facebook likes. It could be any, what's the thing that you're holding on to that you're saying to Jesus, I'm not quite ready to let that one go. We're, we're trying to drag our nets around and still follow Jesus and Jesus is saying, that's not really how it works. That's not really the invitation. What is the thing that you're holding on to this morning? The second challenge is to reorient. It's kind of like how you reorient your furniture, right? If you, like I didn't have a TV for like 12 years. That's not a cool thing to tell you. I just didn't have one. I don't know why. I just didn't. We recently got one and like our whole room shifted. Have you noticed? Every chair, even in the basement, all points towards the TV. It's magical. I have no idea why. Like we reorient around the TV. This is part of what Jesus is asking. To not just pray a prayer, not even just drop the nets. That's a start but to begin to reorient everything I am and everything I do. Listen, listen to the way that Luke records it. He says, if you wanna be my disciple, okay, if you wanna be, here's the requirements. You must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. That would be a tough job application to sell on monster.com, wouldn't it? How many of us would say, no, that's, that's too intense for my taste? But what he's saying here 
is that we have a tendency to put God in like number two or number three and assume that he's pleased with making, the, making it to the top five. That's not the case. That's not the invitation. He knows that if he's in number two or number three, who's ultimately still on the throne? It's me. I'm still calling the shots. I'm still holding the nets. This isn't because Jesus is like jealous or he's unsure of himself, he's insecure. He's like, if you don't actually reorient around me, you'll end up doing this halfway in, halfway out Christianity and it's not the fullness that I desire for you. I think for a lot of us, if we're really, really honest with ourselves, Jesus makes a great savior but not a great role model, right? We're, we're glad for like the crucifixion, resurrection stuff so I can go to heaven when I die, but I don't actually want my life to look like his. I don't know that I actually want to pattern my parenting after him. I don't want my children to make decisions the way that Jesus did. And so the third is respond. And see, this is the piece that I think we often miss. Because it's one thing with those first two to kind of sit in a room like this and we kind of nod our head and like, yeah, 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 release. I'm totally there. I'm into that. Reoriented. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then it comes to actually responding, actually doing something. And maybe you've sat and heard a talk like this before and you nodded. And maybe you even prayed a prayer or checked a box. Those are all good things, but you never actually responded with your life. You've maybe even been calling yourself a Christ follower for decades. But you know that you've not actually allowed your heart to be changed. You're still holding on to the net. I think Dallas Willard gets it right. says an apprentice is someone whose ultimate goal is to live their life the way Jesus would live if he were me. And that doesn't work with a 99% in kind of mentality. Jesus says, all I ask of you is all of you. And that, by God's grace, is what we are leading towards. I, I want to see my neighbors the way that God sees them. I want to see my marriage the way that God sees it. I want to see injustices in the world the way that God sees it. I want my heart to break for the things that break God's heart. Being a follower of Jesus means forfeiting neutrality in the face of injustice. Being a Jesus person means we don't get to say, that's not really my concern, that's not really my thing. Because my life and my will and my heart and my mind is being formed by Rabbi Jesus. And that, that changes everything. And I'll be really honest, sometimes the assumption is that like if you're a professional Christian, like a pastor, you're on a stage somewhere, that you've like figured it out, nothing can be further from the truth. My journey is full of bumps and potholes and detours by the grace of God, I'm just stumbling back, back towards the cross. Jesus, keep forming me. Keep molding me. Keep making me into who you want me to be. And that's why apprenticeship is not like in and out Christianity. It's about my trajectory, my heading towards Jesus. However fast or slow, however long or short, reorienting everything that I have, everything that God's entrusted me with to him. And not saying, I'm gonna hold on to that one net over here. It's dropping your nets and getting out of the boat. That's the invitation. And when we take that seriously, that changes everything. It's a lifetime pursuit. It's a one-time response followed by a lifetime of responding. That's how we're formed. That's how we're shaped. And no, it's not easy. And I could spend the entire day up here talking about the mistakes that I've made, the times I've veered way off path. But God is a loving Father who calls after us time and time again, who gives us second, third, fourth, fifth chances over and over and over again. And get this, you're invited to every single one of us and every single person you've ever met. You're invited to. It's about saying yes. So this is my challenge. Accept the invitation. Because here's the thing. Jesus doesn't take applications. He gives invitations. Your pedigree doesn't qualify you and your performance doesn't preclude you. 
He's not interested in taking applications of all the great things you've done or plan to do or how great or holy you are. He doesn't take applications. He gives invitations and you're invited to the party. That's really, really good news. That when we can do nothing to save ourselves, he comes after us. And maybe you're here and you've identified as a Christian, but like you're realizing it's been an in and out type of Christianity and you've never really been an apprentice. Let that change today. Again, I think Dallas Willard says it best. He says, non-discipleship is the elephant in the church. It's not the much discussed moral failures, the financial abuses, or the amazing general similarity between Christians and non-Christians. These are only effects of the underlying problem. The fundamental negative reality among Christian believers now is their failure to be constantly learning how to live their lives in the kingdom among us, the kingdom here and now. He's saying that's really the issue. And I think he's right. Obviously, there's brokenness in this world. Obviously, there's toxicity and symptoms. But the more that we allow King Jesus to really be king in our lives, he's King Jesus, not King elect. He's not interested in being king somewhere down the road once we die. He's saying the kingdom is here and now. And maybe, honestly, your lives feel flat because you've settled for an in and out Christianity. You've settled with being king of your own kingdom. And in your heart of hearts, you know, man, I feel like, I feel like I'm missing something. What, what if you said yes to the invitation? I think there are two ways we could respond. The first is communion. And I love that we do this every single week together. Communion is one of the ways that we meet Jesus together. And you'll see in a moment, we have the trays up here and back there. But it's not just a memorial for something Jesus did. In fact, listen to how the Apostle Paul puts it. He says, it's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ. And it's not the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ. He's saying, man, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we meet Jesus and we're participating and bringing about healing and redemption in the world. It's saying, I'm in. I don't want to be a spectator somewhere off in the stands. I'm in. I'm eating this bread, drinking this cup, and recognizing that when I couldn't save myself, you came after me. And the second way we can respond is baptism. Baptism is this beautiful sign and symbol of death and resurrection. Augustine calls it an outward sign of an inward grace. In baptism, when we go underwater, we reenact Christ in his death and burial, but we identify with the resurrected life. That's what happens at baptism. It's a way of saying I'm all in. And honestly, maybe you're here today and you had no idea this is what we were talking about, but you sense something stirring, that God's poking, that he's nudging, that you're realizing that maybe I said yes a long time ago, but I settled for a different version where I've never actually even said yes at all. Maybe today is the day that you actually are obedient in baptism. And my guess is even just saying that probably freaks a bunch of people out. There's probably so many questions in your mind when you hear me say maybe today is that maybe one of the questions is this. I was baptized as a baby. Should I be baptized again? I'll say briefly, when we read the New Testament, there are two things that we see. One, every time someone's baptized, it's their decision. And two, it's by immersion. I would say if you were baptized as a baby, being baptized today is actually one way of affirming the decision that your parents made all those years ago. The thing that they longed for you. Maybe a question that you're grappling with this morning is this, what if I have family or friends who are not here today that I wanna see this? It's totally understandable. We're filming the entire thing though. We have professional photographers. We're gonna capture every moment. We're gonna bring the fourth and fifth graders into the balcony so they can experience this with us. We will make it so easy for you to share the day with people who are far. Maybe, maybe this is a question you're wrestling with this morning. I wanna get baptized, but do I have to do it in front of everyone? I'll just put it this way. That's kind of the point. <laughs> That's why we often do weddings together. It's a public decoration, and it's a way of, for us declaring we're in this together. We're better together that when we celebrate baptism, we're saying this is a family affair, and we're here with them, and we're here for them. Don't let that stop you today. Maybe this question is the one you're wrestling with. What if I don't have clothes to change into or a towel to dry off with? It'd be weird if you brought one. Totally get it. 
maybe you notice there's a whole team of people in the lobby. They're the really caffeinated ones. They're as excited as I am about today. They will take care of all your needs. We have a shirt to give you. We have shorts, which I promise are super stylish. We have blow dryers. You might leave prettier than when you got here this morning. It's very possible. We've thought of everything. They will walk you through every single step. Don't let that stop you from dropping the nets, from being obedient today. And, and maybe you're thinking this, maybe this is your question. I didn't plan on it. You know who else didn't plan on it? The disciples. To them, it was just like any ordinary day. And maybe today for you feels like any ordinary day. And God is whispering to you saying, drop the nets, drop the nets. Follow me, be shaped by me. Don't let today pass. Don't, don't ignore whatever that stir is, that nudge is. And lastly, the one that I hear a lot is this. Don't I need to have my life all together before I get baptized? Nothing could be further from the truth. In baptism, we declare that when I couldn't save myself, God comes after me. He pursues us and forgives us when we could do nothing to save ourselves. So this is what we're gonna do in just a couple of moments. In a couple of moments, I'm gonna invite you to come forward to receive communion, to exit out the right side of your row, to come forward, head back the left side of your row, eat, drink when you're ready. But I'm also gonna invite people to move to the back lobby. If today is the day and you know that, you feel it in your gut that God is stirring, you're saying, I wanna be all in for the first time or the hundredth time, I've not done it, I've not actually let go of the nets, I wanna invite you to move to that back lobby to actually move your feet, to be obedient to what Jesus is calling each and every one of us towards, to die to our old selves and to walk in the newness of life. Let's pray together. God, thank you for loving us way beyond what we could dream or imagine. To be honest, better than I can even understand the word love myself. If we're hearing that for the first time, for the 10th time, God, would that take root in our hearts. And God, for those of us who are thinking, is he speaking to me? God, would you give them the courage to know just how loved they are, how known they are. Give them the courage to put one foot in front of the next to let go of whatever that net is that's tangling them up to say yes to you today, to die to our old selves and to walk with you in the newness of life, God. Because when we do that, that changes everything. We thank you, God, and we love you, and we pray all of this in the powerful healing name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen.